Okay, so the last branch of the nervous system we're going to talk about is the afferent branch of the peripheral nervous system. Right, so this is the branch sending information to your central nervous system. Okay, so the efferent branch sends information away from the central nervous system. Afferent sends it to the central nervous system. And you have afferent neurons that are sending information from your visceral organs to tell your brain what your heart rate is. Okay, what's inside your stomach? You aren't consciously aware of that information. Okay, visceral afferent information doesn't go to your consciousness. Right, your sensory afferent information is what ends up going to your consciousness that you're consciously aware. So these are your somatic sensations, so those coming from the skin surface, right, as well as proprioception. Who knows what proprioception is? What's that telling your brain? Where, what kind of stuff? You're exactly right. Where stuff is, oh, you're doing the robot, right? Where your limbs are, okay? Proprioception is telling your brain where your limbs are, okay? And then our special senses, our vision, our hearing, our taste, our smell, we become consciously aware of. Okay, so perception is your interpretation of the external world based on sensory input, okay? We don't have a true reality picture though because our receptors detect only a limited number of existing energy forms, okay? So we don't have electroreception, okay? Sharks have electroreception. They can detect electrical fields. Right, so when you're thrashing around in the ocean, they can detect the action potentials coming off your skeletal muscles. Right, and that's one of the ways they find their prey, is muscle contraction sends off electrical signals. Okay, we can't see UV light. So you know how white flowers just look white to us? They're kind of boring, right? Usually those have really bright UV colors that bees and butterflies and birds can see, right? But they just look white to us. Right? Our brains are not high fidelity recorders. We manipulate data. Okay? If you don't believe me, here's a couple optical illusions. So is there an actual square up here? Well, there's no, there's no lines. We just sort of connect the lines. Okay? Because squares are common shapes that we see very often. Okay? Do you see a vase or two faces? Well, you can see both, right? Yes, of course you can see both. Okay, what do you see first, a duck or a rabbit? A duck? You don't see either? Or you can't see the screen? The duck, this would be the bill. Rabbit, this would be the nose and the ears. Okay, how about these lines? Are they straight in the square? They are straight, but do they look straight to you? No, they look warped. Okay, so optical illusions are all about your eyes and your brain not being high fidelity recorders. Okay, so what we're going to do today is talk about some receptor physiology. And then knowing about receptors and how they work, we'll talk about the somatosensory system, vision, hearing, taste, and olfaction. Okay, so receptors come in two types. Receptors are either specialized endings of afferent neurons, okay, so they're specialized dendrites, you can think of them as that way, or the receptors are completely separate cells from the afferent neurons. Okay, your olfactory receptors are specialized endings, whereas your taste receptor cells are separate cells. Okay, your photoreceptors are separate cells from the afferent neuron. Most of your somatosensory information, your thermoreceptors, your pressure receptors, your nociceptors are specialized endings. Your hair cells in your ears that give you your sense of hearing are separate cells. Okay. 
So when you have a specialized ending, okay, that stimulus is gonna lead to a graded potential. If the graded potential is great enough to bring the axon hill at the threshold, afferent neuron fires an action potential. When it's a separate cell, that stimulus is gonna cause depolarization of the receptor cell, and it's gonna cause it to release a neurotransmitter. And then if enough neurotransmitter binds to receptors on the afferent neuron, it'll depolarize afferent neuron, bring it to threshold, afferent neuron will fire an action potential. Okay, so the types of receptors we have are photoreceptors, mechanoreceptors, thermoreceptors, osmoreceptors, chemoreceptors, and nociceptors. Okay, photoreceptors, sensitive to light, and are used for what special sense? Vision. Okay, and your photoreceptors are separate cells. Mechanoreceptors are sensitive to mechanical energy. So these would be your pressure receptors in your skin, but also the hair receptors in your ear are mechanical receptors. Okay, pressure receptors that detect blood pressure, so visceral receptors for blood pressure are mechanoreceptors. Okay, thermoreceptors are sensitive to heat and cold, and they're important for somatosensory information to tell you how hot or cold the object is you're touching. But you also have thermoreceptors that are telling your brain what your internal body temperature is. Okay, so thermoreceptors are both for sensory information as well as for visceral information. Okay, osmoreceptors detect changes in solute concentration. So very important for determining the osmolality of your bloodstream, which your hypothalamus wants to know. Right, so osmoreceptors are important for visceral information. Chemoreceptors are sensitive to specific chemicals. So ones for oxygen and carbon dioxide and pH are important for visceral sensations. Right, but your sense of smell and taste rely on chemoreceptors as well. Okay, and then nociceptors are your pain receptors. Okay, and they are sensitive to anything that could be damaging. All right, some of your receptors adapt and stop sending signals. And some of your receptors, as long as the stimulus is there, they send a signal to the brain. Okay, so receptors can either be phasic, where they turn on and off, or they can be tonic, where they continue to send the signal as long as the stimulus is there. Okay, tonic receptors are your muscle stretch receptors, so you always know what your skeletal muscles are doing, as well as joint proprioceptors, so telling your brain where your joints are, okay? Vision is also a tonic, so photoreceptors are also tonic. What do you do to stop visual input? Close your eyelids, right, to block light. Okay, phasic receptors rapidly adapt. So a lot of your tactile receptors in your skin rapidly adapt and stop sending a signal. Your olfactory receptors are also phasic, right? So you'll walk into a room, you'll notice that there's some weird smell. 10 minutes later, you don't notice it anymore. It's not that it doesn't smell anymore, right? It's just that you stop sending a signal to the brain. Okay, so here we have two figures showing tonic versus phasic. So the bottom of both of these panels is the stimulus strength. So notice the stimulus strength is the same for both A and B, right? We just have a tonic receptor versus a phasic receptor. So up here we have receptor potential, and so we get a graded potential in response to the start of the stimulus, and as long as the stimulus remains, we maintain depolarization in those tonic receptors. Signal continues to go up. Okay, for phasic receptors, you get a signal, right, when the stimulus starts, and then oftentimes you get a signal when the stimulus stops. Okay, so say you wear jewelry or watch. Okay, when you put it on in the morning, you realize that it's there, you notice it. A Couple of minutes later, don't notice it anymore. 
right? But when you take it off, you notice it again, right? And the off response isn't necessarily hyperpolarization. This figure is just showing it as that. It could be another depolarization. Okay, sensory information follows a path from the sensory receptor all the way up to the cortex. Okay, and somatosensory pathways are where you have receptors, so let's think pressure receptors in your skin. They're specialized endings on the afferent neuron. Okay, the afferent neuron is also called the first order neuron, and you can think of it as being the first neuron to fire an action potential. Okay, it fires an action potential, and the axon terminals are now inside the central nervous system. And they're gonna synapse in the spinal cord or brain stem. Okay, so remember, some of them might synapse in the spinal cord to cause like a withdrawal reflex. Okay, but they're also gonna synapse in the reticular formation of the brain stem onto a second order neuron. And this is the second neuron to fire an action potential. Second order neuron goes from the brain stem up to the thalamus. Remember, one of the major roles of the thalamus is to determine what goes up to your cortex. Is it important or not? Okay, and so the thalamus, the second order neuron in the thalamus synapses on the third order neuron, so it's a third neuron to fire an action potential, and that's gonna go up to your cortex, and if it's somatosensory information, what part of your cortex is it going to go to? The what? I hear you mumbling. Go ahead, say it out loud. I bet you're right. Post-central gyrus. Yes, which we called the somatosensory cortex in this class. Okay. Right. We use a less technical term. Okay. Right, so it's going to go up to the somatosensory cortex, and that's where you localize where the stimulus is occurring and how strong the stimulus is. Okay, taste information is going to go to the gustatory cortex, olfaction is going to go to the olfactory cortex, hearing is going to go to the auditory cortex, vestibular information, so that's balance and equilibrium that is also occurring in your inner ear. Right, goes to the vestibular cortex. Visual information goes to the visual cortex. Okay, so those third order neurons, in the case of vestibular information, taste, somatosensory cortex, and auditory information, they're all third order neurons. We'll talk about olfaction and vision. Okay, vision goes to the thalamus first and then to the cortex, and smell goes directly to the cortex. Okay, they do not go through the brainstem. All right, so we talked about motor units. We also have sensory units. Okay, so sensory units are a single afferent neuron and all the receptors, so either specialized endings of the afferent neuron or receptor cells associated with that afferent neuron. Okay, so a sensory unit is the afferent neuron and all the receptors associated with it. All of these receptors are gonna be the same. Okay, it's not like some of these dendrites will be sensitive to temperature and some to pressure, right? And you're not gonna have a photoreceptor and a taste receptor, okay? They're all gonna be the same. All right, so we've been talking about receptor physiology. So we're going to talk a little bit about sensory coding, how sensory receptors code for the stimulus type, okay, how they code for how intense the stimulus is, and then how they code for where the stimulus is occurring. Okay, so we're going to go through each of these steps, stimulus type, stimulus intensity, and stimulus location. Okay, so stimulus type is based on what's called the theory of labeled lines. Okay, so there's a specific pathway from sensory receptor all the way up to somatosensory cortex if we're talking about somatosensory information. 
Okay, Respe specific receptor types are sensitive to specific stimulus. So if it's a mechanoreceptor, it is sensitive to changes in pressure. Okay, it's not sensitive to temperature. It's not sensitive to chemicals. It's not sensitive to light. Okay, so anytime this mechanoreceptor detects a change in pressure, fire an action potential up the afferent neuron, the first order neuron, first one to fire an action potential, it's gonna synapse right in the brain stem and send the second order neuron up to the thalamus where it's gonna synapse again and send the third order neuron up to the primary somatosensory cortex to the area where there's a map of the body, okay? For mechanoreception and proprioception, that labeled line is called the dorsal column medial lumniscal pathway, but I won't ask you about it, okay? Just so you know. So it's going up through the dorsal column, okay? And then through the medial lumniscus, and then it hits the thalamus. That's where that name comes from. But basically, all your proprioceptors and mechanoreceptors, okay, they're always gonna fire action potentials along the same chain of neurons. And they're sensitive to specific types of stimulus. Okay, the way intensity is coded for is action potential frequency, okay? It's never magnitude, right? Because action potentials are all or none. They either fire, and they're always the same magnitude, or they don't fire. And so frequency is how many action potentials are fired per minute. So here we have a single action potential being shown in green. So it shows the depolarization, repolarization, and hyperpolarization. That's why the little bump goes below minus 70. Okay, it's just highly compressed. Okay, it's just being shown as a single line. But that's an actual action potential. Depolarization, repolarization, after hyperpolarization, back to rest. Okay, here we have the stimulus down here at the bottom figure. So stimulus strength. So if we have a mechanoreceptor and that stimulus is pressure, you just put slight pressure. This is the receptor potential, which causes a certain frequency of action potentials. When the stimulus gets stronger, the receptor potential gets greater and you can fire higher frequency action potentials, right? So you get more action potentials per second. And the brain picks up on that. It says, oh, that stimulus is even stronger. We're getting higher frequency action potentials, okay? Okay, stimulus intensity is also coded for by what's called population coding. So the more intense the stimulus is, the more sensory receptors get involved. Okay, so here we have a single afferent neuron that has a large receptive field. Okay, lots of sensory receptors associated with a single afferent neuron. When the stimulus is weak, only some of those receptors get activated, so you're gonna fire low frequency action potentials. Okay, when more receptors get activated, associated with that afferent neuron, because the stimulus is stronger, you're gonna fire higher frequency action potentials. So here we've got population coding and frequency coding happening at the same time. If instead we're talking about multiple afferent neurons, all with small receptive fields, a slight or a small stimulus, a weak stimulus, sorry, is only gonna activate one afferent neuron, okay? Whereas a strong stimulus will activate multiple afferent neurons. And that will also tell the brain that the stimulus is stronger. Okay, so it's just a difference between receptive field sizes, small versus large. Okay, so, how does your brain determine where the stimulus occurred? For somatosensory information and vision, it's all based on receptive field sizes. Okay, how about for hearing? How do you determine where the sound came from? You get another sensory system involved, don't you? Right, so your ears are on either side of your head and whichever direction hits which ear first, right, you're gonna detect that as a stronger stimulus and then you turn your head and use your eyes, right? 
Okay. But for somatosensory information and vision, it's all about receptive field sizes. So it's all about acuity. Okay, so acuity is determined based on the receptive field size, how much overlap, and the presence of lateral inhibition. Okay, so high acuity, so the ability to pinpoint the location of the stimulus is due to low receptive field sizes. Okay, so small receptive field sizes lead to high acuity. Right? Lots of overlap leads to high acuity. And lateral inhibition leads to high acuity. Okay, so small receptive field sizes, loads of overlap, and lateral inhibition lead to high acuity. So color vision, which is due to your cones, Okay, cones have small receptive field sizes. There's lots of overlap, and they do lateral inhibition. So you get clear, crisp vision when you're using color vision. Okay, whereas rods, which give you your night vision, rods have large receptive field sizes, very little overlap, and no lateral inhibition. So when you wake up in the middle of the night, and the lights are off, everything looks a little blurry. Not because you need glasses, although maybe it's because your glasses aren't on, right? But even if you have perfect vision, everything's still blurry because your night vision doesn't have high acuity because your rods don't have high acuity. Okay. Right. You tested the acuity of your somatosensory system using a two-point threshold test. Okay, and here's average two-point discriminations for lips versus calves. Okay, so your calf, you have really large receptive field sizes for those somatosensory neurons. Okay, so a single afferent neuron has loads of receptors associated with it. Whereas on your lips, you have really small receptive field sizes, lots of overlap and lateral inhibition. So you get high acuity at your lips, and low acuity at your calf, okay? So lateral inhibition happens when you have overlap, okay? So here we have three sensory receptors, okay? So X, Y, and Z, okay? And the one means that they're first order, okay? So they're the afferent neurons. They have those somatosensory receptors associated with them. Here we have frequency of action potentials. Okay, this is the number of action potentials per second for each of those afferent neurons. The stimulus is directly under Y1, but it's strong enough that because of the overlap, some of the receptors on Z1 and some of the receptors on X1 get stimulated as well. But Y1 fires the highest frequency action potentials because the stimulus is strongest underneath Y1. Okay, then we go to the synapses in the brainstem. Okay, and so we have the afferent neurons synapsing with the second order neurons. So X, Y, and Z now have twos because they're the second neurons to fire an action potential. These are the ones that are gonna run up to the thalamus. We also have these inhibitory interneurons. And so what happens is Y1, right, it has the strongest frequency of action potentials. And it tells these inhibitory interneurons to inhibit the signal being transmitted from Z1 and X1 to X2 and Z2. So you notice here, at frequency of action potentials from Y1 to Y2 does not change. The frequency and action potential between X1 and Z1 decreases at the second order neurons because these inhibitory inner neurons are blocking the release of neurotransmitter from the axon terminals in X1 and Z1. And that allows exact pinpointing of where the stimulus is occurring. Okay, it increases acuity. The presence of lateral inhibition increases acuity. Okay, and you see it when you have lots of overlap.
Right. Any questions about receptor physiology? Okay, right. so let's start talking about the sensory systems themselves. So we'll talk about somatosensory first, and then we'll talk about vision, right? And then on Wednesday, we'll start talking about hearing and equilibrium, taste and olfaction. Okay, so our somatosensory system gives us information about pressure changes on our skin surface, temperature changes on our skin surface, as well as painful experiences on our skin surface. Okay, so pressure is due to mechanoreceptors that are in the skin, temperature is due to thermoreceptors that are in the skin, and pain is due to nociceptors in our skin. Okay, and then the somatosensory system also includes proprioception, so telling our brain where our limbs are. Right? So those are due to mechanoreceptors. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about those skin thermoreceptors. We've got warm receptors and cold receptors. We know the warm receptors are just free nerve endings, okay? And we think the cold receptors are free nerve endings, but we're not 100% sure, okay? It's not all worked out yet. What's being shown here is frequency of action potentials versus the skin temperature, okay? Red is showing the warm receptors. Okay, blue is showing the cold receptors. So as we go above 35 degrees Celsius, and skin temperature is 37 degrees Celsius, so as you touch something that's warmer than your skin, okay, it's gonna warm your skin above 37 degrees Celsius, and those warm receptors are gonna fire higher and higher and higher frequency action potentials up until about 45 degrees Celsius, and then frequency of action potentials plummet, and then these are nociceptors taking over. Okay, so this balloon line here is nociceptors. So they're detecting potentially damaging temperatures. Right, you're gonna start to cook your skin a little bit. Okay. Cold, once you touch something that's below body temperature, those cold receptors are gonna fire higher and higher frequency of action potentials. Okay, until you hit about 20 degrees Celsius, and then the frequency is gonna drop down. And it's not being shown here, but you're gonna have nociceptors that will also fire at low temperatures. Because if you touch something really cold, what does it feel like? If you hold your hand on a piece of ice cube, eventually it starts to feel like that ice cube is hot, right? Because nociceptors only code for burning. Okay, so whether you touch a hot stove, or you hold an ice cube in your hands, or if you touch dry ice, right? Super cold and super hot, nociceptors code for burning, okay? Cold receptors and warm receptors will tell you if what you're touching is warm versus cold. But if it's too hot or too cold, it's nociceptors and it's coded as burning, right? And you withdraw your hand as quickly as possible. Okay, you also have a ton of mechanoreceptors in your skin. So here we have a cross-section of skin with the epidermis and the dermis and the hypodermis. And we have skin mechanoreceptors that are rapidly adapting. So that means they stop sending action potentials and we have skin receptors that are slowly adapting. And that means they continue to send action potentials as long as the stimulus is present. So remember we talked about tonic versus phasic receptors. Okay, so which ones would be phasic receptors? The rapidly adapting or the slowly adapting? The rapidly adapting, okay? So the Pacinian corpuscles, the Messner's corpuscles, and hair follicle receptors all rapidly adapt. They're phasic. Stimulus starts, they send an action potential, okay? They tell your brain you'd put your socks on, okay? The stimulus continues, they stop sending a signal, okay? The tonic or slowly adapting are your free nerve endings, your Merkel's discs, and your Ruffini's endings. As long as the stimulus is present, they'll send a signal to the brain. It might not go up to your consciousness, right? It could get stopped in the reticular formation or in the thalamus, so you might not be consciously aware of things touching your skin, but they are continuing to send a signal, okay? so. 
for the exam, you don't need to know which are rapidly adapting versus slowly adapting. I will tell you something like the obsidian corpuscles stop sending a signal, and then you have to tell me if it's tonic or phasic. Okay, so don't worry about memorizing which ones are rapidly adapting versus slowly adapting. I use it as a way to make sure you understand tonic versus phasic. Okay. Right, perception for somatosensory information comes from your primary somatosensory cortex, which is in which lobe of your brain? Your parietal lobe, exactly. Okay, so that somatosensory cortex is receiving information from the opposite side of the body because information crosses over in the spinal cord. Okay, so your right somatosensory cortex is getting information from the left side of your body, left somatosensory cortex from the right side of your body. Right, and it's receiving information from mechanoreceptors, okay, and proprioceptors as well as nociceptors and thermoceptors, okay? So we already looked at that dorsal column medial and lumniscal pathway, okay? So your, all your mechanoreceptors and proprioceptors follow the same first order, second order, third order neuron up to the primary somatosensory cortex. Okay, the nociceptors and thermoceptors, so your warm and cold, thermoceptors follow what's called the spinothalamic track. Okay, so they synapse in the spinal cord, and then the second order neuron goes up to the thalamus, and the third order neuron goes to the primary somatic sensory cortex. Okay, so that's where that spinothalamic track. And oftentimes their reflex is associated, especially for nociceptors. Okay, you touch something really hot or super cold, and you have a withdrawal reflex right away, right? Okay, and that first synapse is occurring in the spinal cord. Hi. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about pain in detail. So we're going to talk about pain in detail for somatosensory information. Okay, you have nociceptors, which are your pain receptors. Okay, and they are sensitive to a bunch of different sensations that could pot potentially damage or distort your tissue. Okay, so anything that could damage or distort. And you've got three categories. You've got mechanical, thermal, and polymodal nociceptors. Okay, mechanical and thermal are fast pain nociceptors. Polymodal are slow pain nociceptors. Okay, and we'll talk about fast pain versus slow pain in just a minute. But your mechanical nociceptors respond to mechanical damages. So whenever you cut yourself, okay, whenever you crush your finger or whenever you pinch your finger. And then thermal nociceptors are extreme hot or extreme cold. Okay, temperatures that will damage your tissues. They'll either cook your skin, right, or they'll freeze your skin. The polymodal nociceptors respond to both temperature and mechanical distortions. Okay, that's what polymodal means. They are sensitive to all different types of stimuli. And that's why after you've hurt your finger, okay, as soon as you get a paper cut, you know exactly what you did. You cut your finger, okay, and you know exactly where that cut was even if it wasn't big enough to draw blood, okay? You still know exactly where you got the paper cut. And then maybe the next day, your finger hurts, and for the life of you, you can't remember what you did to it, right? And that's because it's the polymodal nociceptors that are sending signals, okay? Your finger got hurt, but it responds to all sorts of damaging type of stimuli, so it just tells your brain that your finger hurts, not what happened to your finger. Yeah. Well, oh, that, so <laughs> you're actually causing cellular distortion. So those are nociceptors. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you're distorting those cells. So it's actually the mechanical nociceptors that are firing. And then after the burn's taken place, it's the polymodal. Yep. Okay. 
So here we have a nociceptor, which are specialized endings of the afferent neuron. Okay, so this is the afferent sensory neuron. It's being called an afferent pain fiber. It's the first order neuron. Okay, here's the cell body. And then here's the axon terminals that would be within the central nervous system. Okay, so this would be in the spinal cord. We're going to have the synapse with the second order neuron. So here's the second order neuron here. Your afferent pain fibers use substance P as the neurotransmitter. Okay, so the neurotransmitter of your afferent pain fibers is substance P. And a fun fact is naked mole rats don't produce substance P. Okay, so they don't feel any pain. One of the weird things about naked mole rats. Okay, they also don't get cancer, so they're being used in biomedical research right now. Okay, so substance P gets released, and it causes the second order neuron to fire an action potential. Second order neuron is going to run up to the thalamus, but it also branches and runs to the reticular formation. Okay, and it's going to increase your alertness. So if someone you find someone passed out on the sidewalk supposed to pinch and twist, okay, in order to revive them. That's what you're trying to do. Okay. The thalamus and the reticular formation are going to send signals to your hypothalamus and limbic system to cause the behavioral and emotional responses to pain. And when you're a kid, what do you do when you get hurt? You cry. You do not laugh. Okay. <laughs> And when you get older, sometimes you still cry, but what more often do you do? What are behavioral responses that adults have to being hurt? Swearing, exactly. Okay. And then a third order neuron gets moved from the thalamus, or sent from the thalamus, up to the spastic sensory cortex, so you can localize where that pain occurred. Okay? But oftentimes you have the emotional response before you even know where you had the damaging stimuli. Okay, and often there's been a reflex associated with it. You did the withdrawal reflex, you did the cross extensor reflex if you stepped on a nail. All right. So here is a table showing differences between fast and slow pain. Okay, so fast pain, I already told you, is due to mechanical and thermal nociceptors, which are more specific. Okay, those afferent neurons associated with the mechanical and thermal nociceptors are myelinated. Okay, for slow pain, those polymodal nociceptors, those signals get carried on unmyelinated afferent neurons. And what does myelination do to action potential speed? increases it, okay? So that's why fast pain is called fast, because it's on myelinated neurons. Okay, fast pain gives you sharp, prickling sensations that are easily localized, and it's that first painful experience, okay? So if anyone's brave enough, give yourself a paper cut right now, right? And you'll know exactly where you got the paper cut, be able to localize it right away. Okay, slow pain, that those polymodal nociceptors give a dull, aching, burning sensation that's really poorly localized. You just know your whole finger hurts, okay? You can't even localize where the paper cut was if it wasn't deep enough, okay? Your whole finger hurts. And the point of slow pain is so that you baby that limb or appendage, okay? So that you remember you just damaged it. Be careful with it, okay? Slow pain occurs second. It sticks around for a longer time, and most people find slow pain way more unpleasant. Okay, yeah? Um, I can't remember the terms for it. You just used them. Um, but basically, the ones that. Sorry, so in nerves, in nerves? some of them will stop sending the signal. Oh, phasic versus tonic. Yes, so I'm assuming fast pain stops sending the signal, whereas slow pain. Exactly. Slow pain is tonic. As long as your finger is damaged, it's going to continue to send a signal. <laughs> right? And once everything is healed, it will stop sending the signal. Hey, 
Pain is super unpleasant, so we want to stop it, right? One thing that stops it is from preventing prostaglandins from being released. Okay, so the presence of prostaglandins, which are these chemicals your body makes, right, it lowers the threshold of your nociceptors. It makes them more likely to fire action potentials. So all the over-the-counter pain remedies like Tylenol and Advil and aspirin, those work by decreasing prostaglandin production. Okay, so the over-the-counter pain stuff is just decreasing prostaglandin production. Okay, in order to raise the threshold for your nociceptors, okay, so that they won't send signals. Yeah. You specifically just highlighted the term over-the-counter. Yeah, over the counter. You mean you don't need a prescription? Right, but my question was, does that mean that there's different ways of dealing with pain when you have, like, yes, like, yes, we're going to talk about that. Okay. Okay. I, well, I was just wondering. If yeah, no, we're going to talk about that. Okay. So the stuff you can just go to the drugstore and buy, right, just works by decreasing prostaglandins. The good drugs, we'll talk about how they work. Okay. So our brain has a built-in analgesic system. Right, to suppress the transmission of pain. So the nociceptors are still firing, but we want to suppress them going to the second order neuron. Okay? And that depends on opiate receptors. So opiate receptors are within the central nervous system. Okay, and they're sensitive to our endogenous opiates like endorphins and calphalons and dynorphins. And all the highly addictive pain prescription drugs. Okay, so the prescription painkillers are hitting those opiate receptors. Okay, look at that endogenous system though. Okay, so here we've got the nociceptor. So say you step on a nail. Okay, that afferent pain receptor is going to fire action potentials, and here we have a blow up of what's happening within the spinal cord. Okay, so within the spinal cord, that afferent pain fiber is gonna release substance P, which is gonna bind to receptors on the second order neuron. Okay, you have an endogenous analgesic system, which is basically descending pathways that are causing these interneurons that are inhibitory to release Enkephalon or endorphins or dynorphin. Okay, so those are just neurotransmitters released by interneurons that are inhibitory. So they're going to inhibit the release of substance P and inhibit the response of the second order neuron. Okay, so the painful stimulus is still occurring. Nociceptor is firing, but your endogenous analgesic system is inhibiting the signal at the second order neuron. And if it inhibits at the second order neuron, it's not going to happen no action potential of the third order neuron, you won't be aware of that painful stimulus. Okay, so people who go and run marathons, or especially those ultra marathons, oftentimes they'll end, they'll take off their shoes, and their toenails will be off, right? Their feet will be bloody messes, but they'll say, I didn't feel any pain. Because exercise causes the release of endorphins. Right? Blocks the feeling of pain. Or in battlefield situations, people will get shot and still continue on. All right? Because of that stress causing the release of endogenous endorphins or analgesics. Okay? The prescription drugs, the ones that are super addictive, are doing the same thing. But the problem is, is that if you have continuous release of those opiates or continuous intake of those opiates you just put on more receptors on both your pain and your second order okay and then you need more opiates to cause the same response and then you put on more receptors and then you need more opiates okay and then you go off the opiates and everything's excruciating okay so if you don't need them don't take them yeah so, if like if we take more opiates and we become addicted to them, uh -huh. can those receptors be less receptive? Yeah. 
So you put on more receptors, so you actually need more opiates to get the same response. Okay, so is what's happening in addiction. Right, and then once you go off the opiates, you get withdrawal symptoms because you have to downregulate all those receptors. Okay. Yep, uh huh. Um, so does that mean in cases of chronic pain that the receptors might slowly downgrade because they're being saturated so often? It's not that the receptor, it means, so in chronic pain, you might be putting on more and more receptors, right? And so you need more and more of the endogenous analgesics or exogenous analgesics in order to block the pain. Yep. Okay. Your internal organs have nociceptors. Okay, but you do not have an area in your somatosensory cortex for your heart. Okay, but you need to know when your heart is undergoing something that's really painful, like a heart attack, where a portion of your heart's not getting any oxygen and those muscle cells are dying. You want to alert your consciousness to that, right? So that you take care of it, right? So what happens is visceral pain, okay? So nociceptors that are detecting painful things occurring to your visceral organs, synapse on the same second order neuron in the spinal cord with a, a nociceptor that's mapped to specific area in the skin. Okay, so that pain gets referred to a skin surface. Okay, so when you're having a heart attack, this is especially true in males, not as true in women, but in males, if you have left shoulder pain, that is a hallmark of heart pain. Right, because you don't have an area in your somatic sensory cortex for your heart, you do have an area for your left shoulder. Okay, so if you haven't done anything to make your left shoulder hurt and all of a sudden you get intense pain in it, well, we'll go to the doctors, maybe the emergency room. Okay, maybe call 911. Right, in women, that's not a classic sign. Right, women don't necessarily have left shoulder pain, sometimes they'll have abdominal pain. Okay, so everyone is a little different, but in males, it is a classic left shoulder pain for a heart attack. Okay, heartburn. Okay, you probably have all have felt heartburn in your life. And the reason it's called heartburn is the skin surface over your heart really hurts. And that's because your esophagus is burning with stomach acid, right? So the nociceptors in your esophagus, either because you weigh over eight or your esophageal sphincter is a little leaky, okay, either one. You get some stomach acid up into your esophagus. That's going to cause nociceptors to fire like crazy. And they synapse at the second order neuron with somatosensory receptors, those nociceptors on the skin surface above your heart. Okay? And this is just showing various areas where, in general, visceral pain gets referred to on the body surface. Any questions about somatosensory? Yeah. So that's an exam, how many of those, do you want us to memorize all of those? Like, no, I want you to understand how referred pain works. The fact that you have two afferent neurons, one from a skin surface, one from a visceral organ, synapsing on the same second order neuron. Okay, <laughs> that's the important part. Yeah. So when... If you're an EMT, you got to memorize all those. Right? Yeah. So when you have a heart attack, why don't you grab your here instead of trying to people always grab their chest? I don't know. Okay. Yeah. I would think that it would be like tons of pain here. Right. Which is what often people <coughs> complain of left shoulder pain. Right. right. If it's just movies, they traumatize it. Yeah. I've never witnessed someone actually having a heart attack, so I cannot <coughs> say whether they grab their left shoulder or if they grab at their heart. Yeah. I've heard that making yourself cough while you're having that pain also helps a little bit because using the diaphragm to help push what blockage might be happening. So keep that in mind. If you have pain, cough as hard as you possibly can. There you go. It will hurt a lot, but it will yep. save your life. Yep. Okay. Any other questions? Let's start talking about vision then. We'll use our eyes to learn about our eyes. Hey. 
So here we have the basic anatomy of the eye. Your eye is fluid filled. Okay, the outermost layer, which is being shown in white, is your sclera. And then here's the cornea. Okay, your cornea is clear. Okay, the middle layer right, is being shown in this darker purple color. And then we've got the pupil as part of the... Um, the uh, middle layer, we have got the zonular fibers and the ciliary body, okay? And then the lens is all part of that middle layer. And then the inner layer is the retina, which is being shown in this mauve color, lighter purple color, whatever you want to call this inner color, okay? So that's the retina. That's where your photoreceptors are. Now what's being shown here is the fovea. That's where you have the highest concentration of cones for your best vision. This is where you want to focus everything. It's on your fovea. Okay, and then where you have your blood vessels entering and your optic nerve leaving is your blind spot because you have no rods and cones there. Okay. Right, so your iris controls the amount of light entering your eye. And it's got two sets of muscles. It's got circular muscles. When they constrict, they get fatter. So they cause pupillary constriction. And then you've got the outer radial muscles. And when they constrict, they pull the circular muscles. And that increases the size of your pupil. Okay. The color of your iris determines your eye color. So this is a mutant with blue eyes. Okay. All blue-eyed people descended from one mutant in Northern Europe. Okay. Your iris is really unique to each individual. And, you know, eye scan technology is the latest for ID stuff. And then the pupil is just the round opening that light enters. Okay, so the first bit of physiology. Parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system control those constrictor circular muscles versus the dilator radial muscles. Okay, so here we have someone with brown eyes. Here's the circular muscles. The circular muscles are innervated by the parasympathetic nervous system. Okay, so when this postganglionic neuron from the parasympathetic nervous system releases acetylcholine, it binds to muscarinic cholinergic receptors on those circular muscles, tells the circular muscles to constrict. When circular muscles constrict, they get fatter. And that causes the pupil to decrease in size or constrict. Okay, those outer radial muscles are innervated by the sympathetic nervous system. When this postganglionic neuron releases norepinephrine, okay, it binds to adrenergic receptors on those radial muscles. When radial muscles contract, they're going to pull the circular muscles and you're going to get the pupil to dilate. Okay, now let's talk about focusing images. So we now know how to change the amount of light entering the eye, okay? Constrict the pupil or dilate the pupil, right? But now we're gonna talk about how everything gets focused on the retina, okay? And notice it gets focused upside down. That image then gets switched in your brain so that you see everything right side up, okay? So we've got two convex structures to help focus light on our retina. We have the cornea, and we have the lens, okay? Convex surfaces focus light, okay? They're taking divergent light rays and causing them to converge, okay? Convex structure, structures cause light rays to converge. Concave structures are gonna cause light to diffract. Okay, so here we have a concave surface and we're going to cause the light to diffract. Those of you who are nearsighted, need glasses for far away vision, your glasses are concave. Okay. Lens and cornea are convex. Okay, so the cornea contributes most to your eye's overall refractive ability, ability to focus light in the right place. Okay, but the shape of your cornea does not change unless you get laser eye surgery, okay? 
So when you get laser eye surgery, they're changing the shape of your cornea to better focus light so you don't have to wear glasses or contacts. Okay, your lens can change. Your lens can either be flat or fat. Right, and that changes your ability to see far versus near. When you wanna see near, you want your lens to be really fat. When you wanna see far, you want it to be flat. Okay, so what we're gonna talk about is the physiology of accommodation. So this is changing the strength and shape of your lens. Okay, so your lens is attached to these ciliary muscles by suspensory ligaments. Okay, and as you age, you lose your ability to do accommodation. You get what's called presbyopia, and it's harder and harder to see things close. Okay, so you might notice your parents start reading menus like this, right? That's because they're not able to do accommodation. Or they just ask you to just tell them what's on the menu. Okay, so here we've got the ciliary muscle. Okay, the ciliary muscle is also a circular muscle. So when it's relaxed, it's thin. Okay, when it's contracted, it's fat. So when the ciliary muscle is relaxed, the zonular fibers are tight and the zonular fibers are attached to the lens. So they're pulling on the lens and that makes the lens flat. Okay, so when the ciliary muscles are relaxed, zonular fibers are tight, lens is flat. Okay, that's for far vision. Okay, when the ciliary muscles are contracted because of parasympathetic stimulation, okay, the circular, the circular muscle gets fatter. That allows the zonular fibers to get slack and the lens will get really fat or rounded if it can. As you age, your lens isn't as flexible anymore. Okay, it can't get fat anymore. So what the heck does that do? Okay, if you have normal eyes, how many of you don't wear glasses or contacts? Whole bunch of you, good for you guys, okay? This is what your eyes do. When you're looking far away, you focus on your retina, everything's clear, okay? So everything on the screen is clear right now. Your lens is flat, you're not doing accommodation. Okay, when you look at your paper now, okay? Your writing hopefully becomes clear, unless it's horrible. Okay? And the reason it becomes clear is because you do accommodation. Your parasympathetic nervous system tells those ciliary muscles to contract, zonular fibers get slack, lens gets fat, increases the refractive index, you focus those lights that it's still diverging as it enters the eye because it's close, you focus it on your retina. It's still clear. But this is why as you lose the ability to accommodation, you're gonna move whatever you're trying to read close farther away. Okay, how many of you are nearsighted? Okay, so that means you are wearing contact lenses or glasses that are concave, right? So what happens is I like to think is my lens is too strong for the length of my eyeball. I'm also nearsighted, okay? So when we're looking at distant objects, what happens is the lens focuses ahead of the retina, so it looks blurry, okay? So when you're looking out in the distance, you see everything's a little blurry because it's being focused ahead of your retina. And then when you look at close objects, your lens is so strong that it focuses on your retina. You don't even have to do accommodation for near vision. Okay, what happens is you put on your concave glasses or your contacts, okay, and that is causing light to diffract as it enters your eye. So now your too strong lens, because the light's diffracting as it enters your eye, will focus directly on your retina. And then when you look at close objects, you'll do accommodation, focus on your retina. Right? Anyone in here farsighted? Not yet. Okay, eventually you will all be farsighted. <laughs> okay, so farsighted is where you can see distant objects really fine, but not near objects. So it could be your lens is too weak, or it could be your lens can no longer do accommodation. Okay, so people who are farsighted get convex lenses, 
And so what happens when you're looking at near, your lens isn't fat enough, everything focuses behind the retina. Okay, so that's why people are trying to pull things farther and farther away so that it focuses on their retina. With convex lenses, even with accommodation, you're going to be able to focus on the retina. Okay, close objects will be clear once again. If you're both farsighted and nearsighted, what do you wear? I mean, if you're neither farsighted nor nearsighted. If you can't see close or far, what do you have to wear? Bifocals. Right? So that means the top is concave for distant vision, and then the bottom is convex for near vision. Or you wear one contact for near and one contact for far, or they fix one eye, laser eye surgery for far, and one for near. Yeah, question? Does it actually, you know, a kid do, you have one of each? Yeah. Because Yeah. So he just wore glasses to make sure he didn't get a headache. He didn't get a headache, exactly. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so we haven't even talked about the receptor portion yet. So your eye, the retina of your eye, the reason you want to focus light on the retina is that's where your photoreceptors are. Okay, so in your retina is where your photoreceptors are. And there's actually three layers of excitable cells. Outermost layer, your rods and cones. Middle layer, your bipolar cells. Inner layer, the ganglion cells. These are the first cells to fire an action potential. Okay, so your rods and cones are separate cells that detect photons. They're sensitive to light. Okay, they send a signal to the bipolar cells. The bipolar cells switch that signal. We'll talk about why. Right, and then they send a signal to the ganglion cells. The ganglion cells are the first order neurons, and their axons join together to form the optic <coughs> nerve. Okay, and where the optic nerve leaves, is your blind spot because you have no photoreceptors there. Okay, but they're the first cells to fire an action potential. Right, so we're finally talking about the photoreceptor or the sensory receptor portion of the eye. Right, and the photoreceptors in our eye come in two types rods, which are rod shaped, cones, which are cone shaped. I want you to notice on this figure, light is coming from this direction. Our rods and cones face backwards. Okay, so they're capturing light that's bouncing off this retinal pigment epithelium. Okay, and so animals that have evolved for nocturnal vision have a shiny coating for their retinal pigment epithelium. So that's why you get the eye shine. Okay, so your cat. If you ever shine a flashlight on your cat, super creepy, right? Because you get that glowing eye thing going. Right, our rods and cones are sensitive to light. Okay, they are the photoreceptor portion. They're going to send signals to the bipolar cells. Right, the bipolar cells then send signals to the ganglion cells. And the ganglion cells are the first cells to fire an action potential. Okay, and they bundle together and form the optic nerve, and where the optic nerve leaves is your blind spot. Okay, cones are found in highest density at the fovea, and cones give us our day clear vision. Right, so your best vision comes from this high concentration of cones that are at the fovea. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about those photoreceptors. Rods are rod shaped, they're much more sensitive to light, okay? Cones are cone shaped, they're less sensitive to light, but they allow you to see in color, okay? So they have the outer segment, which is detecting light, then the inner segment that has the nucleus, and then synaptic t terminals, which are sending neurotransmitter to those bipolar cells. Okay, so your rods allow you to see black and white only. Okay, so that's why they're being color-coded black. And then you have three types of cones that give you your color vision, as long as you aren't colorblind. Okay, if you're colorblind, you're either missing your M cones or your L cones. So your red-green colorblind, it's the most common type of colorblindness. Okay, but we have three types of cones that give us our color vision. Okay, so they're sensitive to light at different wavelengths. 
Right, so here we have a blow up of what's happening in the membrane of the rods. Similar thing is happening in cones, except cones don't use rhodopsin. Okay, they have a different molecule that absorbs light best at different wavelengths to give you color vision. Rhodopsin is the photopigment for rods. Okay, so rhodopsin is associated with retinal. Okay, and then this is the extracellular side. Here's the intracellular side. Rhodopsin is associated with what's called a G protein on the intracellular side. Okay, and it activates the G protein, and then that G protein causes this enzyme phosphodiesterase to start breaking down cyclic GMP. That's the signal transduction mechanism, right? Uses a G protein. We haven't really talked about signal transduction yet, but it doesn't even know, uses what's called a G protein. So let's look at what happens in the dark, okay? So this is not what's happening with you right now unless your eyes are closed. Okay, so in the dark, retinal stays associated with rhodopsin, which activates the G protein, which activates the photodiesterase, which causes cyclic GMP to be formed, which opens sodium channels, which depolarizes the rods. Okay, so here's the weird thing. Your rods are activated when there's no light. Okay, so your rods send a signal when there's no light. Okay. When light is detected, retinal gets associated and disassociates from the rhodopsin, which stops activation of the G protein, which stops the buildup of cyclic GMP, which closes those sodium channels, so you get no signal sense. Okay, so that's why there's those bipolar cells. The bipolar cells switch the signal. Okay, so when there is light, rods stop sending a signal, and then the bipolar cells are saying, oh, that means the rods are detecting light, we're going to send a signal to the ganglion cells. Okay, so the role of the bipolar cells is to switch the signals, because your photoreceptors send signals when they aren't detecting light, and stop sending signals when they are detecting light. Okay, so the mechanism is similar in cones. It's just that there's a lot less photopigment in cones because they're cone-shaped, right? So that means they are less sensitive to light. So they give us our different types of vision. Okay, so rods only pick up black-white. Okay, so everything is shades of gray with rods. Okay, cones give us our color vision. But because they're less sensitive to light, there has to be enough light. Okay, so that's why when you wake up in the middle of the night, everything is gray. Okay, even if you have a red sweater that's hanging on a chair in your room, it doesn't look red because only your rods are stimulated in those low light levels. Okay, rods are really sensitive to light, whereas cones are not. So you have to have bright light in order for color vision. Okay, you have way more rods than cones. 100 million rods versus 3 million cones. Okay, however, cones give you really high acuity. And the reason why cones give you such high acuity is because they have really low convergence on the bipolar cells. So each bipolar cell may be receiving signals from 10 rods, but each cone has its own bipolar cell, okay? So rods have large receptive field sizes, cones have small ones, right? So you get your best, clearest vision from your cones. You get most sensitivity from your rods. So in low light situation, it's all your rods. Okay, your cones are centered around the fovea of your retina, which we looked at, okay, whereas rods are in the periphery of the retina. Yes? That's true, your peripheral vision is different at night versus during the day. That is true, because of where your rods are located versus your cones. OK, 
Okay, so when you're using your rods, you're going to have better peripheral vision than, you know, straight ahead vision. Whereas when we're using our cones, we see really well what's right in front of us with high acuity. Everything's crisp and clean. Okay. So the last thing we're going to talk about with our eyes is how we adapt from going to high light situations to low light situations. For small changes, right, we just dilate or constrict our pupils. And what causes our pupils to dilate, sympathetic or parasympathetic? Sympathetic causes pupillary dilation because it innervates which types of muscles? The circular or the radial? The radial, good. And then parasympathetic causes pupillary constriction because it iterates those circular muscles. Okay, larger changes in light density cause changes in your photopigment. Okay, so this is like going from a dark theater into the bright Utah sunshine, right? Or vice versa. Okay, so we're going to go from light to dark first. So exposure to light bleaches your rods. They are so sensitive to light, they need to bleach in order to not be damaged. Okay, so the opsin actually disassociates or separates from the retinol. Okay, so that they aren't damaged. Okay, no more light gets absorbed. So in bright light situations, your rods aren't even functioning. It's all your cones. Okay, when you move to the dark, you no longer have enough light to activate your cones. Okay, so you need your rods to take over. However, you have to have reassociation between the opsin and the retinol, and that takes a little bit. Okay, so it takes a little while for your eyes to get used to that low light situation before you can see. Okay, so if I shut off the lights right now and turned off the screen, you guys wouldn't be able to see. Okay, and then within a few minutes, you would start to be able to probably make out shadows, etc. Okay, and this is why they think that pirates wore eye patches, not necessarily because they got their eyes poked out by their parrots. <laughs> okay, but because they would cover one eye when they were above or on deck. Okay, so they had one eye for vision, and then when they went below deck, they'd switch it so that the one that, that was covered by the patch stayed sensitive to low light, okay? So then they could see below deck right away. The History Channel says it's true. Okay, so exposure to dark maintains your rods in the most sensitive state. So we're gonna go from dark to light, okay? Your opsin and retinol are associated, rods are fully working. When you move to bright light, that overwhelms your sensitive rods, they have to bleach, okay, before you can see clearly again. So you know when you walk out after being in the movie theater, because you went to matinee and it's super bright and sunny out and it's a little painful, okay, that's your rods bleaching. Okay, so we're gonna do this. We're gonna go from dark to light. Here, I'll shut off these lights. So stare at the screen. Here, look at the dark, look at the pretty flower. And what happened? What did you guys see? A flash of that light. And what color was the flower? White slash gray. I see it as gray when I do this. Right? So that's your rods. Okay? Your cones were used to see the color outline, what color that flower was. Right? But your rods were just seeing that it was darker than the white background. Okay? And so when I switched to just the white black background, your rods were still sensitive where you were looking at that flower and they bleached. And that's what caused that flash or that outline of the flower. Okay, it was the actual bleaching process. All right, so the ganglion cells are the first cells to fire an action potential. So they are the afferent neurons. Okay, and they bundle together right, and travel up the optic nerve, okay, and you get some crossover in the optic chiasm, okay, so some information from your left eye, 
stays within the left hemisphere and some from your right eye stays in the right hemisphere but then we also get crossover and that's what gives us binocular vision is that we have some crossover but not complete crossover okay and our eyes are on the front of our head so we have awesome depth perception okay a lot of prey animals so if you have a pet rabbit Right? They have the eyes on the side of their head. They have terrible depth perception, but they have almost 360 degree fields of vision. Okay? So they're all just about spotting a predator and running from it. Okay? Whereas we have really good depth perception so that we can run down prey or swing through trees, etc. Okay? The second order neuron we get synapsing in the thalamus, and the second order neuron goes to the cortex. Okay, vision does not go through our brainstem. Okay, first order neuron goes to the thalamus, second order neuron to our cortex. Okay. Any questions about vision? All right, let's, oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Is that just for illustration, or do we need to know? No, no, so it's just for illustration that the first order neuron goes to the thalamus, and then the second order neuron goes to the cortex. Yep. Okay. Let's start talking about hearing then. Okay, so our sense of hearing is our neural perception of sound energy. Okay, sound waves. It allows us to identify what the sounds are and where they are occurring. Okay, so sound waves are actual vibrations of air, and we get these regions of compression versus rarefication of air molecules. Right, and our ears allow us to determine the pitch and intensity of those sound waves. Okay, so pitch or tone depends on the frequency. Okay, so this is low notes versus high notes. Okay, so a low frequency versus high frequency. Okay, so frequency is number of waves per second. Right? Intensity is loudness, so it's amplitude. So the distance between the peak and the valley. Okay, so here we have two low frequency. One is soft or low amplitude, and one is loud or high amplitude. Okay, so our inner ear can code for both pitch and intensity. Okay, we use our ears for hearing. Hopefully that is not news to you guys. Okay, and we're gonna talk about the three parts of our ear. We've got the external ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear. The inner ear is where all the physiology is taking place. Okay, the external ear just helps you localize the direction of sound waves, because they're on either side of our heads. Right, so whichever ear the sound wave hits first tells us that the sound is coming from that specific direction. But remember we talked about what do we do in order to localize the sound? We turn our heads and look with our eyes because we're a super visual species. Okay, our middle ear is just transmitting those airborne sound waves okay, to a fluid-filled inner ear. Okay, and whenever we're moving sound waves from air to water, you want to amplify them because everything's muffled in water, right? So if you go underwater and you scream, it's highly muffled. Okay. And then we're going to talk about the inner ear. And the inner ear has two totally different sensory systems. We've got our cochlea, and that is what has our, um, here's our cochlea. I'll just look at it here. Our cochlea, and that contains the receptors for hearing, okay, our hair cells. And then we have our semicircular canals, which are part of our vestibular apparatus. Okay for our sense of equilibrium. So here we have the outer ear or pinna. Okay, and I love that there's a little ear hair right in this figure. Very anatomically correct, okay? 
And then we have our middle ear, which starts at the tympanic membrane. And then we have our three ear ossicles. Okay, and then the stapes pounds on the oval window, and the difference in size between the tympanic membrane and the oval window helps amplify those sound waves, which is the main role of the middle ear. Okay, and then transmits those sound waves into the fluid-filled cochlea. Okay, so our inner ear is fluid-filled, fluid and that fluid is called endolymph. So we have a new extracellular fluid compartment, endolymph. Okay, so we need to amplify sound waves because the inner ear where our sensory receptors are is fluid filled. Okay, so our sound waves pound on our tympanic membrane, which sets our ear ossicles vibrating, and then the stapes pounds on the oval window. Okay, and the difference in size between the tympanic membrane and the oval, oval window helps amplify those sound waves. Okay, let's talk though about the cochlea and the sensory receptors in there. Okay, so here the cochlea is not being shown fully coiled so that we can sort of see everything. Here's the oval window and here we have those sound waves which are areas of compression and rarefication. Okay, they're going to vibrate the tympanic membrane, which will vibrate the ear ossicles, which will then transmit those airborne sound waves into the endolymph inside the cochlea. Okay, and so we've got a bunch of different waves coming in all at once. So we've got some low frequency, okay, and some medium frequency, and some high frequency. And notice that where the tip of the arrow is, they're hitting in different places, okay? So we've got this fluid-filled cochlea, and then we've got a series of membranes. We've got the basilar membrane. Right here we have a blow-up, and let's look at it down here. We've got the basilar membrane where the hair cells sit, and they're the sensory receptors. Okay, and then we've got the tectoral membrane, and they have these stereocilii, which are finger-like projections. Those are not for absorption, right? They're for detecting the deflection of the tectoral membrane. Okay, and then on the top, we have the vestibular membrane. And when the vestibular membrane gets deflected, the tectoral membrane gets deflected, and the basilar membrane gets deflected, and these hair cells get bent. Okay, the stereocilia get bent. And so high-frequency sound waves deflect that vestibular membrane early on in the cochlea, okay, and the medium do it sort of halfway, and then those low frequency do it farther in, okay. These hair cells are the sensory receptors, they're mechanoreceptors, they're detecting the mechanical energy of these membranes being deflected, and they are separate cells from the afferent neurons. Okay, and every hair cell has its own afferent neuron, and they all bundle together to become the cochlear nerves. Okay, so small receptive field, field sizes. Each hair cell gets its own cochlear nerve cell. Endolymph is a strange extracellular fluid because it is high in potassium. Right? Where is potassium normally in highest concentration? Inside the cell. Okay, so I put this bullet point in to remind me. Endolymph is a weird extracellular fluid because it's high in potassium. Okay, those stereocilia are connected to each other by protein bridges. Okay, and the movement of those finger-like projections from the hair cells, alter those protein bridges, which cause opening or closing of ion channels. Okay, you might have noticed the stereocilii are of different lengths. There's a tall one and a short one. Okay, and when those hair cells get bent towards the tall stereocilii, that opens channels and causes depolarization. When they get bent towards the short stereocilii, that closes channels, and causes hyperpolarization. 
And this tells the brain exactly where in the cochlea that sound wave hit. Okay, so here we have a single hair cell. Okay, and we have our stereocilii oriented tall to short, and here's those protein bit bridges. Okay, the ion channels, they're talking about opening or closing are potassium channels. And remember, endolymph is high in potassium. So when potassium channels are open, potassium rushes into the cell and depolarizes it. Right? So remember, endolymph is high in potassium. So that's why potassium's entering the cell. Okay, so when the hair cell is standing up tall, okay, and not being bent, it's sending a signal to the cochlear nerve it's associated with, telling it, hey, we're not picking up any vibrations. Okay, so it's got this baseline action potential frequency going. So this is the action potential frequency on that cochlear nerve. Okay, when that hair cell bends towards tall, that opens up ion channels, more neurotransmitters are going to be released, and that cochlear neuron is going to fire high frequency action potentials. Okay, and that's telling the brain that that particular hair cell is bending towards the tall. When it bends towards the short, it closes ion channels, and that decreases the amount of neurotransmitter released, and so lower frequency action potentials get fired on the cochlear neuron. Okay, and that tells the brain that that hair cell in particular is bending towards the short. So it gives the brain a really good map of what the heck is happening inside the cochlea. Okay, what area of the membranes are being deflected? Because it tells it exactly what all those hair cells are doing. Okay. So, our hair cells need to code for amplitude and frequency. Okay, so amplitude is telling the brain how loud the sound is. Frequency is telling the brain how high or low the sound is. Okay, so high frequency is a high note, low frequency is a low note. Intensity is coded for by the degree of deflection, i.e. the relative change in action potentials. So a loud sound is going to deflect the hair cells more right, and cause larger changes in action potential frequency. Okay, so the more the membrane gets deflected, the more the hair cells get bent, the more they get bent, the more the ion channels are either going to open if they're bending towards the tall or close if they're bending towards the short. So you get a larger change in relative action potential frequency. Pitch or frequency of the sound is coded for on which hair cells are sending signals. Okay, so where on the basilar membrane you're getting deflection, okay? So loudness is relative change in action potential frequency. Pitch is which hair cells are having a change in action potential frequency. Okay, so why do high frequency notes deflect the basilar membrane early on in the cochlea, whereas low frequency can't deflect it until later. The reason for that is that the width of the basilar membrane, that's the membrane again that those hair cells sit on, so each one of these little lines is a hair cell. Okay, so the basilar membrane changes as you get farther from the oval window. So it starts out really narrow and stiff. Okay, so it takes high frequency noises to deflect it because it's narrow and stiff. And once you get farther from the oval window, the membrane gets really wide and flexible. And so low frequency noises can deflect it. As you age or are exposed to really loud noises, you damage some of your hair cells and you're more likely to damage them really close to the oval window or really far. So you lose your ability to hear super high frequency and really low frequency, okay? Because once you damage your hair cells, they are done. They don't regenerate. So this is why you're supposed to wear ear protection, okay? And they're finding earbuds, 
that you guys have all been basically raised with, those actually damage your hearing more than the old traditional headphones, right? So be careful with those earbuds. You don't get your hearing back. Okay, so four sounds, hair cells are the receptor cells. Okay, the afferent neurons that are associated with those hair cells come together and form cranial nerve number eight. Okay, you can just think of it as the cochlear nerve. Okay, one cochlear neuron to one hair cell. Okay, so really small receptive field sizes. The cochlear nerve enters the brain stem and synapses there. Okay, so hearing goes through the brain stem first. Okay, so your hair cells are tonic. They're going to continue to send signals. But when you're sleeping, because it goes through the brain stem and the reticular formation, inhibitory inner neurons there will inhibit the information from then going to the thalamus. Okay, so you can turn hearing off for sleep. So it's going through the brain stem where your sleep center is. Okay, second order neuron goes to the thalamus. Okay, third order neuron goes to the auditory cortex where you have a frequency map. Okay, where you, your brain knows where all those hair cells are. And so when your hair cells increase or decrease the frequency of action potentials, it knows what the frequency of that sound is. And then how much they change the frequency of action potential tells your brain how loud that sound is. Hi. We're not going to leave the inner ear yet. We're just going to switch to talking about the vestibular apparatus. Okay, so the vestibular apparatus we use for our sense of equilibrium. Okay, so we have the saccule, the utricle, and then we have our semicircular canals, the anterior, the lateral, and the posterior. And I forgot the cupula there. Okay, the semicircular canals detect rotational acceleration or deceleration. So if you're shaking your head or you're moving it up and down, right? Those are your semicircular canals detecting that. Okay, the utricle and saccule detect changes in linear movement in any direction. Okay, so if you're sitting in a car and you're detecting that you're moving forward, that's your utricle and saccule. Okay, and also provide information for determining head position in relation to gravity, i.e., are you sitting upright, are you laying down, or are you standing on your head? Okay, the semicircular canals are for rotational acceleration. Okay, your anterior canal detects head movement up or down. Okay. Your posterior canal detects head movement up and down to the side. So like if you're ambivalent. Okay. And then lateral canal detects head movement from side to side. So if you shake your head, no. Okay. So anterior is for yes. Posterior is for I don't know. Okay. And lateral is for no. Okay. Your vestibular apparatus is filled with endolymph, just like your cochlea. Okay? And hair cells are used to detect the movement of that endolymph. So basically, as you move your head around, endolymph is sloshing around in your vestibular apparatus. And those hair cells pick up the sloshing. Okay? So here we have hair cells in the cupula. Okay, again, it's filled with endolymph. Again, we have stereocilii oriented long to short. But what I want you to notice here is that each one of these hair cells is sending signals to the exact same afferent neuron. Okay, so you don't have small receptive field sizes, which is good, because you would be dizzy all the time if you did. Okay, you do not need a smaller receptive field size for equilibrium that you want for hearing. Okay, so as you move, head, right, endolymph is going to slosh around. So when you rotate your head, that's going to slosh the endolymph and that's going to bend the stereocilii. And if they bend towards the short, they are set up just like hair cells in the cochlea. 
when they bend towards the shore, that closes potassium channels. And those hair cells hyperpolarize and send less neurotransmitter to the afferent neuron, and so you get lower frequency action potentials. When your head is still, you're sending baseline frequency of action potentials. When you rotate your head and slosh endolymph in the opposite direction and bend those hair cells towards the tall, okay, that opens potassium channels, you get high frequency action potentials. And that's gonna tell your brain which way your head is moving as well as how fast it's moving. Yeah. <laughs> I can't explain it very well, but the problem is, is that there are other sensory systems that are going into your sense of balance and equilibrium, okay. right? And when they give mixed messages, that's where you get a lot of dizziness arising from. There's also various drugs, I think, that can damage these hair cells and therefore cause vertigo symptoms as well, right? So causing them to inappropriately send signals as if you're moving, but you're not moving. Okay, I have another question. Yeah. Um, in my anatomy class, I was told that endolymph is related to CSF. Yes. Yes. Yes, so. yes that's true. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Although it's still way higher in potassium than even CSF. Okay. okay. It's just a new compartment of extracellular fluid we haven't talked about yet. And it's unique because it is super high in um, potassium. Yeah, but it's ultimately derived from CSF, which is ultimately derived from plasma. <laughs> okay. All right. So, besides your vestibular apparatus, there are other things going into determining your sense of equilibrium and balance, right? But the vestibular afferent neurons synapse in the brainstem. Okay, and then they're going to send second order neurons to the thalamus, third order to the cortex to give you your sense of perception. Okay, at the brainstem level though, they also send signals for eye movements. Okay, to help control your eye movements. So then when you're spinning around, you can potentially keep up. Okay, they're also going to send signals to the cerebellum. This is all below your level of consciousness. Okay, it's all coming from the brainstem in order to control muscle movement for balance, okay? And then you also have other sensory systems, especially eyes that are sending signals to the vestibular nuclei in your brainstem. Yeah? Did I hear you correctly that this entire process is subconscious? This, so the brainstem, the vestibular nuclei is in your brainstem, so it's subconscious. Okay. Yeah, your perception of dizziness is conscious. Right? Or if you're standing on your head, that goes up to your consciousness. But the control of your eye movements, right, as well as some postural muscles, is subconscious. So everything coming out of the brainstem is going to be subconscious. To. Yep. Okay. Everything that's coming out of that vestibular nuclei in the brainstem is on a subconscious level. Okay, but for those of you who get car sick, Right? You especially get car sick if you read in the car because your eyes are telling your brain that you're not moving, right? But your vestibular apparatus is telling your brain that you are moving. So that's what causes car sickness. So if you do get car sick, you're supposed to stop reading and look out the window. Okay? Right. Any questions about hearing and equilibrium? Before we finish with our chemical senses. Okay. So we'll finish up by talking about taste and olfaction. Taste and olfaction are our chemical senses. So the sensory receptors are chemoreceptors. They play a big role in getting your GI tract ready for a meal. Okay, so they affect the flow of digestive juices and affect appetite. Okay, so if I like piped in the smell of McDonald's french fries. Some of you might start to salivate, right? And your stomach might grumble because we're getting kind of close to lunchtime, right? Stimulation of your chemoreceptors in your nose as well as your taste buds can induce really pleasurable sensations. Like when you gorged on all that hot, or um, Valentine's Day, I was gonna say Halloween, Valentine's Day chocolate yesterday, okay? Or objectionable sensations, okay? Our chemoreception, our sense of smell and taste tell us 
if that food, we should eat it, right? Or if we should avoid it. So if you go on vacation and you have some milk in the fridge, what do you do when you get home before you drink it? You smell it. And if it smells bad, you don't drink it, I hope. <laughs> yeah. So I just want to throw this out there for everybody. Um, I've heard that there was a study they've been doing for mind control. And they've, I mean, instead of hearing at night while you're asleep, they put a gas mask on you. And oh. they give you objectionable um, smells or pleasurable ones in order to associate a different reaction with you. So it kind of changes how you feel about things just a slight bit. So yeah, we'll talk about it. So your sense of smell is your only sensation that doesn't even go through your thalamus, right? So your sense of smell really affects, it's part of your limbic system, right? So it can affect memory formation, et cetera. And it's way more sensitive than your sense of taste. Okay. So we'll talk about taste first, or gustation. Okay. So these are chemoreceptors in your taste buds. You have them in your mouth as well as in your throat. Okay. And taste buds consist of a taste pore and your taste receptor cells. Okay. So the taste receptor cells are separate cells from the afferent neuron. Okay, the taste pore is just the opening through which anything you put in your mouth can interact with those taste receptor cells. Those taste receptor cells have microvilli. That's to increase the number of receptors they can have for their specific taste sensation that they're sensitive to. Right, and we'll talk about those taste sensations. But here we have an image of the tongue. And we have a blow up of one of those papilla that you counted in lab, right? And on the papilla, we have all these taste buds. Okay, so here's a blow up of a taste bud in specific. And here's that taste pore, okay? So the chemicals can enter through the taste pore. And here's those taste receptor cells that are sensitive to particular chemicals. And they are separate cells from the afferent neurons. We only have five primary tastes. Our sense of taste is not super varied, okay? We use our sense of smell in addition to our sense of taste, okay? And we can detect way more chemicals through our olfactory system than via our sense of taste. So the five primary tastes are salty, sour, sweet, bitter, and umami. And umami might be the only one that you haven't heard of. Six. What's they the sixth one? Starch. They included starch? Yeah, that was just like the summer they... The well, there you go. Sour. There's a starch receptor too. Okay, mm -hmm. probably works similar to the sweet. <laughs> right. Although if you chew starch long enough, it'll start, start to taste sweet as well. Okay, so salty is stimulated by chemical salts, so sodium chloride. Sour is by free hydrogen ions. Okay, sweet is from molecules that are glucose or glucose-like. So fructose hits your sweet taste receptors, and then all the artificial sweeteners also hit your sweet taste receptors. Okay, bitter has a lot more chemically diverse chemicals that it can detect, right? And people vary on which taste receptors they have for bitter. So some of you could taste the PTC tasting paper and have that particular bitter taste receptor, and some of you, it tasted just like paper, okay? But bitter things are things like alkaloids, a lot of toxic plant derivatives. So some of you think that broccoli or cucumbers are super bitter, and other of us can't taste anything bitter in there, okay? And the whole point of bitter is to keep you from eating something that might be poisonous, okay? A lot of poisons are bitter. That's why we sugarcoat our pills, right? If you ever chew an aspirin, it's incredibly bitter. Okay, and then umami was discovered by a Japanese scientist. That's why I got the name umami. That's for meaty or savory. And that's what MSG hits. So monosodium glutamate that they put in the cheap Chinese food and a lot of canned soups, etc. It's to trick you into thinking it's really nutritious. <laughs> okay. So we're just gonna talk about how some of these taste receptors work, 
Okay, so for sour, hydrogen ions block these potassium channels. Keeps potassium inside the cell. The cell depolarizes, send a signal. Okay, for sodium, so to taste salty substances, the salty taste receptors have sodium channels. So when you eat a whole bunch of sodium chloride, some of that sodium enters the salt taste receptors, depolarizes the cell, releases neurotransmitter. Okay, those are pretty easy. They involve ions and ion channels and depolarizing the cell. Right, so sweet involves that G protein coupled receptor. So when a sweet molecule like glucose or fructose or one of the artificial sweeteners binds to the receptor, it activates the G protein. Okay, causes the breakdown of ATP, which then causes the buildup of cyclic AMP in the cell, which opens, or which blocks, sorry, these potassium channels. Potassium gets stuck inside, cell depolarizes. You don't need to know the exact mechanism. Okay, sweet goes by G proteins. Okay, bitter, we think some of the bitter also are G protein. Okay, but sometimes bitter molecules also block potassium channels, just like the sour ones. Okay, there's different variety of bitter taste receptors, and they either work by G proteins, right, or by those bitter substances blocking potassium channels. Okay, so we have those five slash six primary tastes. I'll look up the starch stuff. Right? But we have other things, especially odor, that goes into our taste perception. Okay? But of course, temperature and texture play a huge role. So maybe you don't like oatmeal because it's mushy, right? If you've ever said that, oh, I don't like that because it's mushy. Right? That's a texture thing. Or if you like something when it's warm but not when it's cold. That's a temperature thing. Okay? And cold food doesn't taste as much as hot food. Right? So heating up food increases the amount of taste you can derive from it. Okay? Also, you get conditioned avoidance behaviors. So if you ate something and then got desperately ill afterwards, you might not like it anymore, right? Even if it wasn't what caused your illness, okay? And then we don't really know how the cortex fully does taste sensation, but boy would General Mills like to know, right? To make everything even more delicious so that you buy it. Okay, so the sensory neurons for taste run along cranial nerve seven, nine, and 10, right? But they go, the important part is they go to the brainstorm, brainstorm, brainstem first, okay? So taste goes to the brainstem, then second order goes to the thalamus, and then third order goes to the gustatory cortex, okay? And this is in the parietal lobe near where your mouth portion of your somatosensory cortex is. And this is how it can combine things like temperature and texture with actual taste. Okay, because temperature and texture are going to go to the mouth area of your somatosensory cortex. Okay, because those are somatosensory receptors. Capsaicin or spicy, those are a type of nociceptor. Okay, so that's why really spicy food tastes painful, right? All right, the last sensory system we're going to talk about is olfaction. Your olfactory receptors are specialized endings of the afferent neurons. Okay, so your two types of chemoreception have different systems. Taste are separate cells. Olfactory receptors are specialized endings. Okay, and they are renewable. Okay, so if you did not follow the directions in chemistry class, and didn't smell, or you smelled an acid or something, right, and burned out some of those olfactory receptors, they will grow back. But still, don't sniff anything in chemistry class. Okay, the receptor portion is in your olfactory mucosa, which is in your nose. I assume you knew that your nose is where your olfaction, sense of olfaction came from. Afferent neurons go into the brain. 
Okay, and the olfactory receptor cells form the olfactory nerve. Okay, and they go directly to your cortex. Okay, so here we have a cross section of the nasal cavity, right? And notice as you chew, odors can get into your nasal cavity, right? Here we have a blow up of that nasal epithelium. Here's the specialized ending of those olfactory cells, okay? And they've got a bunch of supporting cells which will help them to regrow back. And then here's the axons of those olfactory nerves, okay? And this is the only thing between your nasal cavity and your brain, right? And here's the olfactory bulb, okay, which is part of your cortex. Okay, so odorants are molecules can be smelled. In order to be smelled, a molecule has to be sufficiently volatile, meaning it can get into the air. If it can't get into the air, it can't get into your nose, it can't be smelled. But then it also has to be sufficiently water soluble so it can get through the mucus layer. Okay, so things to be smelled have to be volatile and water soluble enough to get through the mucus layer. So we don't smell everything. There are things that can't be smelled. We have a thousand different type of olfactory receptors. So our sense of smell is way more varied than our sense of taste. Okay, and all those olfactory receptors work through second messenger systems. So like sweet taste reception. Okay, so they work through G proteins. Okay, and then all those signals get sorted in the glomeruli within the olfactory bulb. And let's up of the olfactory bulb. Okay, so here's the olfactory bulb, and we have all those afferent neurons. Okay, and so you might have a olfactory receptor that detects like pine type scents, okay, which are terpenes. And then right next door, you might have an olfactory receptor that detects a different type of scent. Okay, so they're going to run to different glomeruli. And that's where the sorting for the different types of scents is occurring. Okay. So the communication between the afferent and second order neuron happens in the glomeruli. Those second order neurons form the olfactory tract and go directly to your cortex. So there's no brainstem, there's no thalamus involved. Okay, so your sense of smell is super powerful and it's part of your limbic system. Okay, so it plays a role in memory formation or evoking really strong memories. Okay, any questions about the sensory system? All right.